The Appalachian Trail is about uh, 2,100 miles. Apparently there is some debate about its exact number of miles, but that's a fair enough estimate. It uh, traverses from Georgia to Maine through 14 states. And if you were just to decide that you wanted to uh, hike the entire Appalachian Trail, you probably want to start fairly soon because it takes about five months and it will require about 5 million steps from walk to walk from end to end. I am not going to be doing the Appalachian Trail. That is a fairly significant undertaking. And in fact, thousands of people uh, decide they'd like to give it a shot every spring and not all that many finish. It is truly a remarkable endeavor. And it takes you through all sorts of different kinds of locations, including a lot of remote places that we would fairly call the wilderness. Bill Bryson um, contemplating uh, hiking the Appalachian Trail, beginning to read about all of the places uh, it uh, travels through, uh, said he began to realize that the woods were full of peril. Rattlesnakes and water moccasins and nests of copperheads, bobcats, bears, coyotes, wolves, and wild boar. Loony hillbillies destabilized by gross quantities of impure corn liquor. Rab rabies crazed skunks, raccoons and squirrels, merciless fire ants, and ravening black fly. Poison ivy, poison sumac, poison oak, poison salamanders, even a scattering of moose lethally deranged by a parasitic worm that burrows a nest in their brains and befuddles them into chasing hapless hikers through remote sunny meadows and in to glacial lakes. My goodness, lions and bears and snakes and all the rest. The wilderness is full of the unexpected and the unknown and in uh, many ways, the perilous. We have been thinking about uh, the wilderness in this season of Lent together, thinking both about the way that Jesus begins his uh, earthly ministry uh, it, with a time in the wilderness, 40 days in the wilderness, a time set apart in a place that is remote and um, uh, unmanaged, in a place that is uh, understood in scripture as dangerous and uncertain, a place that is understood in much of the Old Testament as a place where men and women find themselves disoriented, a place that is desolate and deserted. This is how scripture speaks to us of the wilderness. We are thinking too about how Jesus turns towards the end of his earthly ministry with a journey. Luke records that he set his face towards Jerusalem. And so we have set our faces towards this understanding of the wilderness in this time of Lent. On the way to Jerusalem, he taught. And those teachings include the parable which we've read today, known to us most commonly as the prodigal son. I'm gonna say that the prodigal son is arguably the best known of all of Jesus' teachings. People who have never been within 10 miles of the Bible um, in, at least in Western culture, um, often are familiar with the phrase prodigal son and kind of maybe vaguely have an idea uh, what it generally means, right? Um, I mean, I think you could make a case for the Good Samaritan as well, but uh, these are very well known even among people who haven't uh, dived into the Gospel of Luke, which is where they need to go to really find the details because um, the prodigal son is preserved only in Luke's account of Jesus' life. As we think together in these days of Lent uh, about the ways journeys and transitions can feel treacherous, um, about how being in the midst of the unknown and the, the uncharted 
can, um, can feel so very scary about how uh, feeling unmoored and alone, uh, even when you're in a crowd, uh, can be terrifying. We're asking ourselves, what, is, uh, what lessons are there to learn for our lives in this walk in the wilderness, in this time of the unknown, in this, in this moment where things seem to be shifting and we're not exactly sure how they're going to re set themselves. We feel like we've left uh, a, a lot behind and are definitely moving in a good direction, but where it's taking us, we're not quite sure. And for many of us these days feel like a wilderness. Um, old, old ancient maps used to uh, uh, record the, the uh, parts of the world that had not yet been mapped and charted uh, with the phrase, beyond here, there be dragons. <laughs> and uh, there are many days where I feel like I'm standing uh, before a place where it might as well be marked, beyond here, there be dragons. And you don't have to be out in the wild or on the Appalachian Trail to feel like you're in the wilderness. You can stand in the middle of Times Square and feel entirely unmoored and uncertain and alone. If we're honest with ourselves about this scripture we've read today, about this uh, prodigal son, this parable, um, it is challenging. Jesus teaches this parable uh, uh, to a, a gathering of people, and the scripture tells us that uh, it includes both sinners and tax collectors and Pharisees and scribes surrounding him. And he, he uh, teaches this in, in, as part of a succession of scriptures, uh, the, known also to us as the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost sheep, and then the parable of the prodigal son. These are all about grace, so you'd think they'd all sound really great. So why are we challenged by this parable? I like how William Sloan Coffin thinks about it. We tend to identify with the older brother in the prodigal son, because like him, we want the irresponsible kid to get what he deserves. But the prodigal love of the father insists that the son gets not what he deserves, but what he needs. Forgiveness, a fresh start, which is exactly what, thank God, God, gives all of us. We can't be relieved of the consequences of our sin, but we can be relieved of the consequences of being sinners, for there is more mercy in God than sin in us. Many of us do identify, I think, with the older brother, in part because we see uh, so clearly the faults of others um, and we might recognize our own faults, but we have really, really, really good reason. Or we feel bad about those errors in judgment where we're much more comfortable ascribing the errors of others to character flaws and suddenly get very concerned about justice. We orient our, ourselves in the mind of the older brother and begin to ask questions of the text like, but is he really contrite or is he just putting on a show for his father? And how is this fair? Particularly when we realize that the, the whole welcoming with a, with, a, with a ring and it means that he is fully acknowledged as family, brought back into the fold, not required to go through any sort of uh, rigmarole to be accepted fully and completely as a son, but known, embraced, brought back, all because he showed up. I wonder if we are never more concerned about fair 
than when we think somebody is about to get what's coming to them. And if you're like me, you might have a list of people you'd like to see get what's coming to them. Do I want a whole bunch of dudes on the Senate Judiciary Committee to get what's coming to them? Yes. Yes, I do. Do I really want God to have a come to Jesus meeting with Governor Greg Abbott and a whole bunch of state legislators across the South around the needs and rights of trans kids? I do. But perhaps that's why God is not in charge of, that's, perhaps that's why I am not in charge of cosmic justice. And Jesus is fully aware of this impulse in us. And he's also fully aware of exactly how the crowd is going to hear his teaching in this. Because again, remember I said he is surrounded by people grouped as sinners and tax collectors and Pharisees and scribes. So you've got team younger brother and team older brother. And how you orient yourself in this story has a lot to do with how you feel about what happens to each brother. How you um, understand yourself is uh, a lot about how you're going to align yourself with the characters and the people in the story. And that's because our culture teaches us that when there are winners, there are certain to be losers. That, that, that when something good happens to somebody, it almost certainly means that something bad will happen to somebody else. And that is, you have plenty. Maybe I won't have all I want. And we become competitive about so many things. We're easily competitive about money. We're competitive about time. We're competitive about space, We're competitive about privilege and stature. So our instincts often drive us to be competitive about God's grace, which is entirely unnecessary, but antithetical to how we're groomed in the world in which we live. Instead, the key in this parable, I think, wherever you know one, no matter where you align yourself, whether you're team younger brother or team older brother, the key is in the father's words to the older brother. We had to celebrate. We had to celebrate. Sarah Rudin um, translates, translates that expo sentence as, we had no choice but to celebrate. Much of life would be different if you moved through the world with that attitude. Rather than, than, than um, uh, trying to figure out uh, who's getting what they deserve and who deserves a break and who really needs to have a come to Jesus meeting and, and who should be shamed and who should be shunned and who should be cast aside and who's not welcome. Rather than if we were so busy trying to categorize people and put them in the right places as if cosmic justice were up to us. What if we instead moved through the world with the expectation that we were going to encounter all kinds of moments when we had no choice, 
no choice, no other option than to celebrate. That the option to uh, count the cost was, was not ours. That the, that the option to judge was not ours. That the option to uh, ascribe guilt and blame and fault and, and determine fairness was not ours, but our only option was to celebrate. Grace is a reason to celebrate. Grace is a reason to celebrate. Grace leaves us no other choice but to celebrate. On the Appalachian Trail, um, hikers talk about something called trail magic. As I said, you, you spend about five months trekking through 14 states if you decide to do the whole thing end to end. So it's a bit of a slog. And if you read the accounts of hikers, they'll talk about these hard days when they just wanted to give up. And, and these moments, they just didn't think they could come up with, with the energy or the enthusiasm or the strength to even make it to camp that night. And they just were over it. And in those moments, something magical happens. Maybe it's a, um, an igloo cooler filled with sandwiches that somebody from a nearby town left for hikers traveling through. And they hadn't really had anything fresh in a few days. The bottles of water left with it. Maybe it's the offer of a ride to a campground where they can get a shower from a stranger. They hadn't even had the nerve to ask this person if they'd let this smelly stranger get in their car. And the person said, can I give you a ride? Do you need a lift? Trail magic can include finding what you need most when you least expect it. Can mean experiencing something rare and extraordinary or simply just beautiful. Turning a bend, traveling down and seeing a valley spread out before you in blue skies after days of rain. And just encountering unexpected acts of generosity and grace, mercy, compassion that restore one's faith in humanity. The littlest things can feel like trail magic and can remind you that you are part of a family. If you spent, if you spent days and even weeks being largely isolated, save encountering and re-encountering the same few grumpy, tired uh, hikers again and again, everybody struggling in the same way, a little trail magic can make all the difference and can make you feel grace, welcomed, accepted, and known there out in the wilderness. A reason to celebrate, perhaps no choice, but to celebrate. As I said, this big city can be disorienting and can in all of its own ways feel like the wilderness. You can come up from the subway and have absolutely no idea where you are or which way is north. You come up in the grid, you're standing there, and you know, some of those corners don't have the, the street signs on them, and I'll stand there and try and figure out which way to go, and nine times out of ten, I'll, I'll go the wrong way. It feels like there's nobody to ask. Sometimes you can bump into a hundred people in a day and still feel alone. You don't have to be out in the wild to feel like you're in the wilderness. 
how far would a little trail magic go in this city? What sorts, what sorts of experiences of grace and forgiveness and wonder and beauty and kindness and compassion and welcome and acceptance offered in the name of Christ might you provide all of those wandering the wild of this town and all the places we go. When we're lost, we trust we can be found. Let's help others know that, experience it there. And together, let's celebrate. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.